So welcome everybody to the 12th annual senior thesis uh, poster session. It's a very special day. You don't see me with a tie like this often. Uh, so it is a big, big event. Um, and what we are going to do today is celebrate the work of our seniors who have worked for you know, a year or more on their research projects with many of you. My name is Martin Stute and I'm a professor here at Barnard College and I'm uh, uh, the sort of point person for the senior seminar, but I have seven other colleagues from, from DEES, from E3B and from uh, the Sustainable Development Program that have been helping me uh, with the senior seminar. <clears throat> so before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event, which is the Earth Institute and then of course the involved departments which are listed um, at the bottom of the slides, they have all contributed a lot to this, to this class. And then we have uh, two saints in our department, Leslie Rauker and uh, Catherine Cook, who have been helping with the poster session and throughout the semester, and have uh, rescued many students uh, in the printing process and, and other steps on the way. Let's clap their hands. Um, last not least, I'd like to thank many of you. You are research mentors for our students, and without you, this wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't be possible for our students to do cutting-edge research and really pushing the envelope, and we thank you very much for that as well. So we have two parts to this poster session. Um, we will have, uh, give the students an opportunity in one minute to give an overview of their project. And in the order that we are going to go through, this is on your program. It's in, and then the numbers that are in your program next to the student's name also corresponds to the posters that we are going to move into the center of the room in a minute. Um, and after the 40 minutes, we will move the chairs to those corners of the room and then move the poster boards into the center of the room. And then we have time until 6.30 with some food and drinks and we will look at the posters. So let's get the show started. Hello, uh, my name is Moyo Ajayi, and my senior thesis is Carbon Dioxide Exchange in Arctic Shrubs. Um, this past summer, I joined above the Arctic Circle to the Alaskan Tundra to examine shrubs' efficiency in the carbon dioxide exchange. To be the most efficient, plants allocate nutrients to the leaves that are the most exposed to sunlight in order to get the most out of photosynthesis. The, this optimization reflects the relationship between carbon dioxide exchange and plant mass as an, exp ex as an exponential relationship, the green curve in the prediction figure, um, as well as inf inefficient carbon dioxide exchange returns a logarithmic curve, and that's the red curve in the prediction figure. I constructed a chamber made out of PVC pipe and clear non-diffusive uh, non plastic to isolate the shrub from the environment, and I measured the change in carbon dioxide over time. My results showed a slight correlation, but still significant, and a, the hint of an exponential fit suggests that uh, optimizing carbon dioxide exchange, and therefore that the carbon dioxide footprint uh, as, uh, is a sink in the region. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Arkebauer, and over the past 70 years, there's been a change in tree species composition in Black Rock Forest. So what's been happening is the northern range trees in blue there have been shifting further northward out of the forest, and the southern range trees that are in red there have been shifting northward into the forest. So we wanted to investigate a potential physiological mechanism behind the range shift. So what we did was we went into the forest and shot down branches with a shotgun. Then we took the branches back to the lab and took the leaves and put them inside a cuvette. So the cuvette was sealed off, and we measured dark respiration, which is the amount of CO2 that's coming off of the leaves. So when we grouped by range category into northern, central, and southern, we found that the northern range trees were indeed respiring more CO2 relative to the central and southern. So this may mean that they're at a physiological disadvantage relative to the central and southern species. And this could have some potential results about how uh, influencing the carbon storage capacity in these forests. 
Good afternoon, my name is Crystal Qualo, and my research question was, is tree migration influenced by the respiratory quotient, a study in Black Rock Forest? So basically, since the 1930s, three northern range tree species have left the region, while seven southern range tree species have invaded the area. We decided to look at the respiratory quotient to see if it could explain the migration patterns observed. Respiration is a process greatly needed by plants to undergo seed germination, reproduction, and growth. The respiratory quotient is obtained by dividing the carbon dioxide output by the oxygen uptake. What we found was that the RQ value was significantly impacted by temperature, increasing as temperature increased from 15 degrees Celsius to 35 degrees Celsius. We also found that the RQ value was significantly impacted by region, with the northern range tree species having a, high, having a lower RQ value than the central and southern range tree species. These results suggest that as temperatures continue to increase due to climate change, Northern species are going to continue to move towards cooler regions, and the Black Rock Forest, as well as many other ecosystems like it, are going to be significantly impacted. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Yu. Um, as temperatures increase due to uh, global warming, this affects plants geographically or as migration or um, change in species population density and range. Um, and uh, in Black Rock Forest, I uh, studied, uh, I took leaves from eight different tree species across three different geological ranges, northern, central, and southern, as well as two different types, coniferous or pines, as well as broadleaf. And I found that northern range tree species, as well as pines, had the highest rates of respiration, as well as relatively low rates of activation energy, suggesting that southern range tree species, as well as pines, have, uh, have a physiological advantage and have adjusted well to climate change uh, in relation to uh, trees from other species. Hi, my name is Jesse Wayne. My study looked at deer exclosures, which are designed to prevent deer grazing. I did this to determine the effect of deer grazing on vegetation diversity, tree regeneration, and vegetation biomass. This study was done at Black Rock Forest, which is 50 miles north of New York City. It used vegetation surveys to determine the mean species richness, the mean total cover, the number of individual mature trees and size classes of trees inside and outside of exclosures at 13 locations within Black Rock Forest. The study did not have significant results for vegetation diversity and understory vegetation biomass. This could be because of effects not originally considered or because there's no relationship between diversity and grazing or between biomass and grazing. However, tree seedling regeneration results and the number of individual mature tree results were significant. Therefore, it's possible to conclude that exclusion of deer will increase tree seedling regeneration and the number of mature trees inside of an exclosure. Long term, this may have restorative effects on northeastern hardwood forests. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica Gersony. The Arctic is facing accelerated warming due to a multitude of positive feedback cycles that are induced by climate change. And one main impact of this accelerated warming is a shift in community structure from a grass-dominated community to a shrub-dominated community. And what my thesis research focused on was trying to understand if there is a shift in nitrogen concentration in the leaf canopy occurring alongside of the shift in canopy dominance. And we found that there is, in fact, a significant difference. We found out that shrub-dominated um, shrub canopies had a 50% greater nitrogen concentration than the grass-dominated communities. And this has many important implications for the ecosystem due to the fact that the ecosystem is, in fact, nitrogen-limited. And one global important implication is the potential increase in respiration of the plant canopy, which means that the plants would be putting more carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, thus furthering the global climate change and locally furthering um, shrub expansion in the Arctic tundra. Thank you. Hello. My name is Rebecca Gibson, and the title of my thesis project is Analyzing Vegetation Indices as Rapid Indicators of Leaf Pigment Content in the Arctic Tundra. Leaf pigment content provides valuable insight into the physiological performance of leaves. Because pigment content measurements are time-intensive, spectral reflectance measurements, known as vegetation indices, have been used at low latitudes as a proxy for measuring pigments. The purpose of my research was to establish relationships between vegetation indices and pigment content for Arctic vegetation, so that measuring spectral reflectance can be used to monitor pigments in the tundra. Although there was only weak relationships between vegetation indices as a function of pigment content among all vegetation, as seen in the graph on the right or on the left, strong relationships were found when samples were plotted per growth form, as seen in the graph of Forbes on the right. 
In the future, these relationships can be used to monitor changes in pigment content remotely over larger spatial and temporal scales. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Adkins, and my research focused on quantifying um, denitrifying and methanogenic bacteria in primary rainforests, regenerating rainforests, and an oil palm plantation in Malaysia. My results are significant for determining um, greenhouse gases released in the system. So as you can see here, we split it up by land use type and soil horizon. So the top soil, the intermediate soil, and the lower levels of soil were examined, as well as the primary logged and oil palm plantation. So there's significant difference between the top soil and the lower levels of soil in terms of um, microbial activity, which is significant saying that the top layer of soil has the most interaction with the atmosphere, and thus there's going to be more greenhouse gases released in that system. Um, the logged and oil palm plantations had significantly higher quantities of these methanogens and denitrifiers than the primary rainforest, which is significant from a conservation standpoint. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Lavenhar. In recent years, there's been growing interest in expanding urban farming to rooftops in order to help address food insecurities in cities. The goal of this study was to evaluate the microbial communities that play a significant role in nitrogen cycling and in potentially producing greenhouse gas emissions and relate this to nitrogen cycling in rooftop farming systems. Using quantitative polymerase chain reaction, we assessed total ammonia oxidizing and denitrifying bacteria in rooftop farm media amended with four different fertilizers, one synthetic and three organic. We specifically analyzed the 16S, AMOA, and NOSC genes. Results from a sister study were used to form an initial conceptual understanding of the relationship between microbial community dynamics and nutrient cycling. In order to maintain a viable urban agricultural system, this kind of careful consideration of the nutrient needs of local bacterial communities may prove vital to both providing food and reducing urban greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emma Kale, and I worked on uh, reconstructing plyopleistocene vegetation in East Africa using plant wax biomarkers. Uh, so I focused on a site in the Turkana Basin, shown on the map on the left, um, and we focused on a time period around two million years ago. So we analyzed carbon isotopes from sediments from this region to be able to differentiate between woody cover and grassy cover on the landscape. Uh, our results are shown here on the right. Um, and you can see in the red and the blue that over time, going up on the graph, uh, we see a trend from uh, a more woody landscape to a more grassy landscape. Uh, this is a very promising result because you can compare it to the black data points, which are previous studies using soil carbonate data. And you see that they, uh, the trend is similar. Um, this is also a very important result because it shows us about what the landscape may have looked like during an important time and place of human evolution. Thank you. Hi, I'm Frankie Pavia. Atmospheric dust is an important part of Earth's climate system. It affects the radiative balance and provides a source of micronutrients to parts of the ocean that are otherwise lacking them. Leaf waxes are organic constituents of, of the dust fraction that have recently been found to co-vary remarkably well with traditional inorganic dust proxies. However, we don't know very much about the source of these leaf waxes, how they get entrained in the atmosphere, and how we can use them to further understand dust uplift and entrainment. In order to do this, I differentiate between two potential mechanisms for leaf wax and train in the atmosphere, and then apply a down core record of their carbon isotopes from a core, sediment core off of Australia to assess past vegetation and hydrological changes. Hi, I'm Alan Seltzer, and I've been working on a project to reconstruct temperature in New Zealand during the last glacial period, which ended about 15 to 20,000 years ago. Um, to do this, I measured the concentration of dissolved noble gases in groundwaters, in paleo groundwaters, that I collected in June uh, in New Zealand. Um, so the way this works is that noble gases, we think, uh, because they're inert, we think they, they're conserved in a water, uh, water atmosphere closed system on glacial interglacial timescales. And because their solubility in water is temperature dependent, then measuring the concentration enables us to reconstruct the temperature, the equilibrium temperature that caused that concentration. 
Um, so I collected samples from three different regions on this map on the right, um, on the north and south islands of New Zealand. And uh, my results on the left here show basically a cooling of somewhere between three to six degrees, although it's poorly constrained for the last glacial. Um, because the southern hemisphere and southern ocean um, are really important for uh, understanding the, the drivers of major climate change uh, on, for, for glacials, um, it's important to better constrain the degree of cooling um, as a function of latitude in the southern hemisphere, and hopefully my results will help us uh, to better understand to an extent glacial interglacial climate dynamics. Thanks. Hello, my name is Han. Um, the current western drought has been persisting for the past 13 years, and it's likely an ongoing event. This study uses observational and reconstructed uh, Palmer's Drought Severity Index, which is an index of moisture balance, to quantitatively characterize this drought uh, in the context of all droughts over the past millennia. So on top, we have a uh, time, uh, time series of annual PDSI that is spatially averaged over the study region of the southwest. Um, and at the bottom, we have two out of six uh, defined characteristics, drought length and drought severity. At 13 years, this current drought is uniquely persistent, with most droughts over the last millennia being uh, less than 10 years. And we surveyed drought severity by comparing the last 13 years to all 13-year periods from 850 to 2012 and taking the average of those. Um, and as you can see, it's also a very uniquely uh, dry 13-year period. It's, in fact, the 21st driest in the, in the last millennia. Um, and, of course, I'd like to take, uh, take a second to acknowledge Jason Smerton, Ben Cook, Ed Cook, uh, Richard Seeger, and, and Sloan Coates for making this study possible. Thank you. How's it going? Uh, my name is Jake Sienko. Uh, I studied the influence of the biological pump on atmospheric CO2 concentrations during the last glacial maxima. Uh, to do so, I measured carbon and oxygen isotopic ratios um, in the calcium carbonate shells uh, of the planktic species Globigerinoides rubri. Um, uh, I got the, this sample came from uh, marine sediment cores from the equatorial Pacific. Um, what I found was a discrepancy in the carbon isotopic ratios um, between size fractions of G. ruber. In the smaller size fraction, we saw a lighter carbon uh, isotopic ratio during the last glacial maximum. Um, however, in the larger size fraction, we saw a heavier carbon isotopic ratio during the last glacial maximum. Um, this could be due to a change in nutrient concentrations due to oceanic upwelling in this area. Um, it could also be due to... Uh, to a difference in the availability and preservation of carbon um, to the different size fractions. Thanks. An overwhelming body of scientific evidence supports that climate change is occurring on a global scale. For human populations, scholars and activists suspect that one of the most significant consequences may be that of human migration and mobility. However, this relationship between environment and displacement patterns, migration patterns, is often assumed, yet little understood empirically, particularly in mountainous regions. My study seeks to understand these relationships in the context of a country highly vulnerable to climate change, Nepal. I compile data on temperature and precipitation anomaly, environmental hazard exposures, and a number of other socioeconomic control factors. Through spatial econometric regression analysis, my results indicate that precipitation anomaly is among the environmental variables most important for migration patterns. Temperature anomaly and exposure to environmental hazards are important particularly for migrants that have internal destinations as opposed to international destinations. And finally, that precipitation anomaly can also be conceptualized as a pull factor in migrant destinations, a perspective not often considered in this discourse. These results hint at the complexity of the climate migration ne nexus in Nepal and across the globe, with significant implications for multilateral policy in the decades ahead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Johanna Bozoa, and I did an economic valuation of Arctic resources in a warming climate. 
The current warming trends uh, we see are intensified in the Arctic, and this has led to a lot of ice melting. This has allowed us access to a lot of resources we didn't before, but also we are losing some. For my thesis, I valued five resources, uh, a sample of five resources in the Arctic currently and cumulatively until 2100. This included oil, polar bears, tourism, cargo ships, and climate services. In order to do so, I used a method called total economic valuation, which creates a holistic economic definition of a resource and uh, that goes beyond a purely market value approach. Results indicated that the benefits of the Arctic can be valued cumulatively uh, by 2100 at about $24 trillion. But the loss of the climate mitigation by the Arctic detracts drastically from the overall benefit. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gabriella Aitchison. Um, it's well established that asbestos causes mesothelioma, but the mechanism through which this occurs is still not well known. So my research looked at the influence of DNA methylation on the expression of a tumor-suppressing gene transforming growth factor beta-induced gene in asbestos-induced mesothelioma cells. Generally, DNA methylation means that the expression gets decreased and when that's happening in a tumor suppressing gene, that leads to greater tumor growth. Um, DN in my project, DNA was isolated from the mesothelioma cell lines and treated with bisulfite to quantify the methylation levels. Um, mRNA was quantified using QRT-PCR and ultimately the results showed no correlation between DNA methylation and mRNA expression but it might imply that there's another epigenetic control in play. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gwen Hicks. Uh, having seen these other slides, I think my attempt at humor is a bit misplaced, but that's okay because the poster is more serious. Uh, I'm working with Dr. Stephen Chilred up at Lamont. Uh, we're looking at secondhand smoking, uh, specifically ways to measure exposure, which is kind of a tricky thing because, well, you either have to uh, look at biomarkers inside the person, or you have to have them carry around something like this, which will measure the uh, suspended particulates in the air. The problem, of course, is how to characterize those samples, the components of those samples, once you've collected it. And so, we've, uh, last summer, I <laughs> adopted a method that Dr. Schiller had invented, and we, sorry. Okay, the point was to characterize the relationship between color on these filter samples and mass of the different particles. And so I created a standard curve that established that relationship. And then we used that curve to analyze samples that were collected over the, past, over the course of the year uh, from children who carried these, fil these uh, monitors around with them. And uh, we also collected biomarker data and we looked at nicotine and I've been taking the uh, results from these filters, comparing them to the different metrics, and it's an attempt to validate whether this monitor actually really works for assessing personal exposure. And from what I've seen, it's actually fairly promising. They do tend to match up with the other markers, and so I think that once we have this down, it will be a cheaper and more effective way to measure this, and perhaps we can look at deeper questions, like how exposure is actually affecting people. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Autumn Bordner, and my thesis project investigates the predictive relationship between carbon monoxide personal exposure and PM2.5 personal exposure from indoor air pollution uh, for mother-child pairs in Ghana. Um, indoor air pollution is a serious public health burden, resulting in 4 million deaths per year, uh, almost exclusively in the developing world. Um, so therefore, there's a lot of interest in initiatives to reduce indoor air pollution and therefore alleviate this health burden. Uh, in order to do this, we need to establish the dose-response relationship between exposure to pollutants and health effects. And in order to do that, we need to monitor exposure. Um, the pollutant of interest, as you may have guessed from the title, is PM2.5. And this is because most, most Serious health effects related to indoor air pollution are thought to be attributable to PM2.5. Um, however, there is currently no practical method for large-scale uh, PM2.5 personal exposure assessment. So my project attempts to develop an indirect method of PM2.5 personal exposure using carbon monoxide as a proxy. 
So I first looked at the relationship between these two pollutants, and then I built a few predictive uh, models of PM2.5 uh, using carbon monoxide and a variety of other environmental and behavioral variables. And I found that a predictive relationship does exist, but it's unclear whether it is robust enough to um, be used effectively as a proxy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susanna Buck. I'm interested in the white-footed mice because they're the most important vertebrate host for Lyme disease. They're the most important because they're the best at reinfecting ticks that bite them with Lyme disease and because they persist in degraded environments where other animals which aren't as good hosts for Lyme can't survive, including forest fragments under five acres. Um, but uh, there's, there's no Lyme disease in the city, so mice populations in the city aren't exposed, while upstate uh, they have very high levels of Lyme exposure. So I wanted to know if this um, affected their immune systems. So I looked at the major histocompatibility complex because it involves in response to disease pressure and I found that uh, evolution at this locus was neutral and that the level of variability in both the rural and urban populations was similar. Hi, my name is Vanda Polkova, and I looked at obesity and physical activity rates in New York City. Because there is such a great disparity in the way the obese and overweight populations are distributed, I wanted to find out which factors correlate the most highly to that cause this distribution. Uh, by analyzing 11 years of New York City Community Health Survey, I found out that education is the most highly correlated factor. And this means that New Yorkers with college degrees are much less likely to become obese um, even than those that have high school degrees. Employment. Uh, as well as education, highly affect the likelihood of a person exercising. Thank you. Hi, I'm Molly Priester. Uh, in a taxonomically rich region like southwestern Amazonia, monitoring biodiversity across large areas is a challenge in conservation research. To reduce expense, one taxon, an indicator, may instead be used to represent the diversity of the broader ecosystem. Butterflies are frequently chosen as indicators due to their sensitivity to habitat changes. I aim to examine whether any subfamilies of Nymphalidae, a large and easily monitored family of butterflies, are effective indicator taxa. It's a, preliminar it's a preliminary evaluation asking whether the subfamilies' abundances are related to overall butterfly species richness. I evaluated 14 sites in southeastern Peru and found that one subfamily in particular, Satyrni, had abundance that was strongly related to butterfly species richness. If the relationship holds over a larger spatial scale, satyrony could potentially be a useful predictor of biodiversity. Hi, my name is Lucia Weinman. My thesis is a comparison of genetic markers for parentage analysis. Parentage analysis has become a powerful tool for addressing a wide array of questions in ecology and evolutionary biology. The idea is that you use genetic data to figure out which adults in your study population are the parents of which offspring. Now, there's two kinds of genetic markers that are typically used for parentage analysis, microsatellites and single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Microsatellites are most commonly used for studies of wild populations, uh, while SNPs have not been used as often. Recent studies suggest, however, that SNPs could be a more viable option because they're cheaper and easier to genotype. However, questions remain about how many SNP loci to use and further comparisons of the two markers are needed. This is especially important for studies of social species with complex kin structure. Here, I compare 102 SNPs and 15 microsatellites for parentage in a free-living population of superb starlings. I find that for all offspring, SNPs and microsatellites identified the same father when pedigree information was included. I also find that the use of the 60 most heterozygous SNP loci give the same results as using all 102. This study is the first to compare SNPs and microsatellites for parentage analysis in a highly social species and should prove informative to future parentage studies. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Ashlyn Crank, and my thesis was based on research I did over the summer with a group from the University of Rhode Island. We studied diatoms, which are the largest, largest group of phytoplankton that are responsible for a fifth of the world's photosynthesis and 60% of the ocean's primary productivity. We were interested in, in learning what factors can inhibit these diatoms populations, specifically in the Costa Rica upwelling dome. Through sampling and experiments, we found that co-limitation of the nutrients zinc and iron along with silica, as well as competition with cyanobacteria could limit these populations. This also resulted in a decreased species diversity. Understanding what factors limit diatom populations can help us predict how future climate changes can affect these organisms and the vital functions they perform. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Smick. My research is on the economics surrounding the application of a carbon capture system to a coal-fired power plant. Coal sourced 42% of power and 34% of all anthropogenic CO2 emissions in the United States in 2011. And as such major carbon-intensive sources of electricity, coal-fired units are prime targets for investigation surrounding carbon capture technology. And though the technology is there, questions surrounding the costs are what's preventing widespread adoption. So we looked at a realistic best-case scenario for plant financial success under conditions of a post-combustion CCS system retrofit. And we looked at three sources of additional marginal cost, those being the energy penalty, the efficiency penalty, and additional variable in operating and uh, operations and maintenance expenses. And we found that under these additional marginal costs, uh, the capacity factor or the time spent generating for that power plant decreased by 50%, and the plant moved very far up the dispatch stack. In other words, the rank order of power plants in order of lowest marginal cost first uh, that, that determines which ones are deployed um, when new demand comes onto the market. And unfortunately, under these conditions, no power plant or no coal power plant can survive. Thank you. Hello, I'm Heidi Keller. Algae are capable of producing a biofuel, biodiesel, that is far superior to other crop-based biofuels in terms of land, water, and nutri nutrient efficiency. So the secret to their success lies in the lipid synthesis pathways illustrated on the left. So TAGs, which are triacylglycerols, are the lipids that we actually want for biodiesel production, but this pathway is only used if the algae is subjected to some sort of stress, such as the presence of pollutants. So my research involved cultivating algae in the presence of pharmaceuticals and heavy metals at a range of concentrations to see how this would affect tag, uh, tag accumulation. I found that at high, co at high concentrations, most uh, pharmaceuticals actually enhance growth. However, most other results were not significantly different from the control, which is still encouraging because this shows that pollutants are not purely detrimental to algal growth. So this, uh, this bodes well for the use of wastewater because it is uh, a low cost, a low cost environmentally and financially uh, low cost option for biodiesel production. Thank you. Hello, I'm Daniel Gurma, and I examined the potential risks of building an open pit my iron mine in the Bad River watershed of northern Wisconsin. The two major concerns of a mine of this type are, first, a, the potential impact of groundwater flow from excavating a large amount of land, and also the potential contamination of the water and air supply through the excavation of dangerous elements during the mining process. To look at these two things, I first made a hydrological model of the watershed and I applied the dimensions of the mine that was going to be built to see how it would affect water flow. And I also gathered uh, different rock samples from the region itself to be put under ICP mass spectrometry laser ablation to see the concentrations of different elements, particularly those in concern. The uh, hydrological models show that there's the chance of a considerable hydrological sink to occur if the mine is built, which could be very damaging to local aquifers. And although I'm still waiting for clearance to use the ICPMS, I did excavate um, natural, re natural occurrences of asbestos, grunerite, and amosite. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nolan Kyer. In New York City, where 72% of the 205 square mile area is impervious surface, a single one inch rainfall event can equate to 6,500 gallons of stormwater runoff per city block. 
This is a particular problem when the city's 460 combined sewer overflows eject nearly 27 billion gallons of wastewater that is excess overburdening the system into nearby water systems. As a result, I targeted tree pits through measuring infiltration rates as a potentially untapped source for stormwater capture. My analysis suggests that those tree pits with a vegetated composition and or guard fences could drastically reduce stormwater runoff if applied to a citywide scale. Thank you. Hi, I'm Adam Colling, and this is a picture I took last summer of the median in between 112th and 113th Street on Broadway. Medians are an example of urban green infrastructure, uh, and along with bioswales, tree pits, green roofs, and city parks, are distributed all across New York, as you can see in the map in the lower corner. Uh, in all types of green infrastructure, there is soil, and in the soil can be found microbes. Microbes are important because they support the plant communities, they cycle nutrients, they break down organic pollutants, and they also contribute to helping mitigate stormwater runoff. But relatively little research to date has focused exactly on the role that microbes play in these urban habitats, in these green spaces. So to that end, my research and my thesis uh, posed a twofold question. Do microbes vary compositionally across geographic space and across infrastructure type? And it turns out that we found that there is significant clustering by infrastructure type. In other words, microbial communities are compositionally distinct in different green spaces. So that is relevant to future policy and planning as well as just the broader goal of understanding New York City as a microbiome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carol Kim. Um, the deep biosphere plays a, a larger role in larger, larger role in the global carbon cycle than previously suggested. Um, my thesis was to develop a method to isolate microbial RNA for radiocarbon analysis to determine sources of organic carbon utilized by active microbial communities living in the deep terrestrial subsurface of the Wyth Watershed Basin in South Africa. Um, RNA isolated from E. coli grown on LB and acetate was used as a control for this method. Radiocarbon ages um, of RNA isolated from E. coli grown on acetate was as expected, and radiocarbon ages from RNA isolated from E. coli grown on LB was slightly older than expected, indicating their sources of laboratory carbon contamination. Hi, my name is Colleen Malvaha, and the goal of my research was to source organic carbon that bacteria are metabolizing in the subsurface at a site in Rifle, Colorado. This is important because not much is known about organic carbon cycling, despite its importance in many ecosystem processes. In addition, the site of research in Rifle, Colorado has been shown to have unique bacteria with metabolic processes previously demonstrated only in Archaea. At this site in Colorado, there are three possible sources of organic carbon with three different dates the first being from river water, the second being from groundwater recharge, and the third being from sediment deposition. The date that we obtained of 3,325 years is similar to the dated uh, dissolved organic matter from the Rifle Colorado site. This similarity indicates that the source of organic carbon that these bacteria are metabolizing is from groundwater recharge, but there are forces protecting this carbon from being used immediately, immediately upon system entry probably consisting of ecosystem properties or a combination of ecosystem properties and recalcitration. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Silvern. In Bangladesh, tens of millions of people are exposed to unsafe levels of arsenic in shallow groundwater, causing a public health crisis. Low arsenic deep community wells are being promoted as a safe alternative. We are concerned that increased pumping in the deep aquifer may cause drawdown of organic carbon releasing arsenic in situ. In order to address this question, we use the radiocarbon signature of microbial DNA as a direct measure of the organic carbon utilized in one typical deep community well. Um, our radiocarbon age came out surprisingly young compared to the sediment and groundwater ages, which do not suggest that there has been recent recharge in the deep aquifer. These results can be explained um, by a leak in the well or transport of organic carbon to the deep aquifer at a rate faster than groundwater flow by motile bacteria.
Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Wagner and my research is on how groundwater velocity affects bacterial transport. So diarrheal diseases are spread through contaminated groundwater and in Bangladesh they are the third leading cause of death in children. Um, monsoons uh, exacerbate the contamination in groundwater by accelerating groundwater velocity and um, a lot of experiments have been done to research how far bacteria is transported in this groundwater, but they consistently underpredict how far it's transported. Um, and one reason for this might be that um, they don't account for the variations in velocity that arise from ponds filling and draining with rapid rainfall events. So we created a velocity mechanism to simulate these variations in groundwater velocity, and um, we found that they, the variations do not enhance bacterial transport as we had um, hypothesized, but we did find that they were significant, uh, that velocity is significant in bacterial transport and that it should definitely be considered in future modeling um, of transport. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ariel Fan, and for my thesis, I researched the correlations between commercial tenant energy usage and also commercial building evaluation. Uh, currently in the US, we have two dominant benchmarking methods, the Energy Star Rating System, which rates buildings based on total energy use, and also the LEED Certification System, which rates buildings based on design. Uh, the more prominent one, Energy Star, was actually recognized by New York City two years ago and uh, through the passage of Local Law 87, which required all buildings over 500,000 square feet to be evaluated with Energy Star. Uh, however, despite its prominence, many believe that Energy Star is not an effective model of sustainability and efficiency in buildings because it does not take into account tenant activities. Uh, thus, for my research, I tried to derive correlations between tenant energy use and also total building energy use, trying to find if certain tenants, such as finan uh, financial firms or law firms, use more energy than, say, uh, a publications firm. And what I found was actually very surprising. Um, number one, I did find that there was a correlation between tenant energy use and energy star rating. Um, and also what I did not anticipate was that the um, buildings with higher amounts of tenant uh, per percentage of tenant use space had um, lower energy star ratings. Um, so check out my poster, thank you. Hi, I'm Reed Jenkins, and I'm getting my degree in earth science from Columbia College. Um, I wrote my thesis on whether accounting for urban microclimates can improve smart energy, smart building, per, uh, smart building performance in Manhattan skyscrapers. There are essentially two parts to my project. One is comparing temperature and humidity trends in Central Park, Midtown, and the Financial District using weather data collected in Central Park by the National Weather uh, Service and from the buildings on temperature sensors on their roofs. Um, and number two, uh, the second part of my project, um, each building I studied is equipped with a energy optimization software and I'm, that uses the weather data. And I'm seeing uh, whether using the highly localized weather data can improve energy optimization. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dale Paddleford. Um, I did my research uh, on the relationships between criteria air pollutants and temperatures in New York City microclimates. I was interested to look at the air pollutants, particularly um, affecting uh, populations affected by asthma um, and respiratory illness. Um, for my analysis, I ran a series of uh, multivariate and linear regressions focusing on these um, pollutants. Um, the, uh, what I found, <laughs> sorry, <I'm> nervous. <laughs> um, the findings were that there was a, there was a positive, uh, significant relationship between pollutants and temperatures uh, for all pollutants, ozone, uh, the nitrogen oxides, um, and uh, particulate matter. Um, however, there was also an inverse relationship between black carbon and ozone which indicates, uh, which speaks to the fact that um, black carbon tends to bind with ozone. Um, and uh, I recommend um, that um, 
that the uh, primary pollutants that form ozone be addressed rather than uh, focusing on ozone itself. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Valerie Japutsis, and um, my thesis was to see um, if there was a correlation that exists between um, public opinion events and hydrofracking in New York State from years 2011 to 2013. Um, what I did was I studied the poll results from the Cunapiac University and Siena College um, polling, pollings that occurred, and they occurred from 2011 to 2013, and they asked residents about their opinions on a multitude of topics, including hydrofracking. I also made a timeline of events and policy from 2011 to 2013, as well as a media study in which I counted newspaper coverage from the same period. Overall, as time increased, there was an increase in opposition that was seen in New York State. Particularly, if you look at the end of 2012, there was an increase in local bans um, as the moratorium was extended and the opposition was increased. There was also a large peak in media coverage at this point. Um, 2013 saw increasing opposition with decreased media coverage as the state grew tired of the increased delay. Thank you. The toxic, oh, sorry. Um, I'm Monica Molina. Um, the toxic release inventory is a corporate disclosure policy that tracks toxic emissions and spurred spatial studies on environmental justice at the local level. TRI data also reveals variation that predicts oh, variation of toxic emissions across the 50 states, suggesting the presence of factors that predict disparate pollution emissions at the state level. From the TRA data, I construct an indicator that measures toxic risk. A panel regression from 2008 to 2010 models the relationship between toxic risk in the individual states and variables representing average population income, income inequality, state government ideology, in addition to an indicator measuring state enforcement of the Clean Air Act. The study suggests that higher levels of income are associated with lower levels of environmental risk in the individual states. Further qualitative analysis presents evidence that supports environmental federalism, that is, the decentralization of environmental programs. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sabrina. So in 2011, 70% of individuals living beneath the poverty line lived in rural areas. In order to understand how to better the lives of these individuals, it's important to understand the development status at hand. So my study aimed to link remote sensing data and capital indicators to create a development model in Assam, India, therefore relieving the need for troublesome census data. Ultimately, I found that seven of the 10 indicators I tested were significant in relation to land class and income. This is one such example where the graduated colors um, show the range in relationships between income and literacy. And therefore, there is obvious potential for the creation of such a model through testing additional indicators. Thank you. Hi, my name is Abigail Golden, and my senior thesis project is about using customary marine tenure for conservation in a Fijian fishing village. Many South Pacific cultures have this system called customary marine tenure, in which villagers have direct legal control over their own local coral reefs. This means that villagers can set up temporary closures called tambu as a conservation measure when they're worried about overfishing. These villagers also possess traditional ecological knowledge honed over the generations about local populations of reef fish and invertebrates, which can help scientists figure out how to conserve these diverse and valuable species. Nainini Village in northern Fiji provides one test case of using marine, the marine tenure system for conservation because village leaders have started a grassroots project to set up a tambu on their local reef. My fieldwork focuses on interviewing villagers and making recommendations about how the tambu should be set up to protect highly targeted species based on villagers' traditional ecological knowledge. I found out that villagers had a 100% support rate for the Tambu project and that they're most concerned about poaching, overfishing, and habitat degradation. Based on the life histories of the most targeted species in Nainini, I suggest that the Tambu should last at least three to five years with an area of at least two square kilometers, twice as large as the current proposed area shown here in yellow.
Hi, my name is Lauren Bailey, and for my thesis, I looked at the successes and failures of integrating traditional, culturally derived management strategies, like those Abigail just described, into a modern conservation approach. So essentially what I did was I looked at 29 sites within the independent states of Melanesia, so Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, and Fiji, that had successfully integrated traditional management into their management approaches. From there, I cross-analyzed these studies to derive a set of best practices. I then compared my findings to the most recently published set of guidelines for designing and managing a plan with traditional elements to evaluate the efficacy of these guidelines. I found these guidelines to be comprehensive but ultimately misguided in their data collection methods. I suggest a standardized collection of data through a universal data sheet, which would minimize cost by outsourcing the expensive process of data analysis. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caitlin Dutton, and my thesis assesses the potential of serious alternate reality games to meet learning objectives in sustainable development via a case study of content analysis methodology. So this type of game allows its players to create a collaborative narrative related to environmental topics. In this case, imagining the, what the world might be like during an oil crisis with the goal of improving players' understanding of the subject matter and provoking behavioral change. However, historically, these games have not been rigorously evaluated. Consequently, this study fills a gap in the literature by assessing the outcomes of participating in World Without Oil by examining the archive of blog posts created by players while simultaneously evaluating the, the efficacy of textual content analysis for this field. After conducting a range of analyses, the results indicated that participants did exhibit improved knowledge of sustainability after playing. However, content analysis programs are unable to yield meaningful results unless researchers define specific learning goals and indicators. Thank you. So it's time for a big hand of applause for everybody.